My name is Cynthia Peterson. I'm with Child Welfare Information Gateway. Um, Information Gateway is the Children, um, Children's Bureau's um, information service. And so I have the pleasure of being the out-of-home care and youth program manager there, where I focus on all of the website content, programs, and services related to out-of-home care and youth. So I am joined today by two of my colleagues, um, Athena Madison and Dr. Tom Mackey, and they're going to do just a brief um, introduction here so that we can all get to know each other before we get started. Hello. Can you hear me? No. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry for that. Um, my name is Athena Madison, and I work for the Children's Bureau um, Capacity Building Center for the Art uh, for the States, and I am a young adult consultant with them. Um, I am here to speak a little bit about my story um, as it pertains to psych meds and the foster care system. Um, there's going to be a time for Q&A for that, but um, we'll get into that. Thank you. Hi there, and um, my name is Tom Mackey. I um, am recently joined the faculty at Rutgers University, um, and for the last several years, I've been doing research around psychotropic medication oversight for children in foster care and for Medicaid-insured children more generally. Uh, and that, that research has sort of been in two areas. In, in one area, it's been very focused towards looking at the state of the states, so looking at what states are doing to provide for oversight for children who are in foster care, um, and then uh, also looking at what is the comparative effectiveness of different state approaches for providing oversight for psychotropic medications? So what works best, essentially, and using Medicaid claims data um, to conduct those analyses. I also work with state systems. I've worked with in com the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, similar like Kentucky, a Commonwealth, <laughs> um, and then also um, uh, worked in New Mexico, Delaware, and now in New Jersey um, that I've arrived to Rutgers, located in New Jersey. So just beginning work with, with them as well. So it's really a pleasure to be here today, and I look forward to speaking um, to you more about this topic. So I'm going to quickly just go over um, the objectives for our talk today. Um, and uh, really, by the end of this presentation, we have a few things that we really want each of you to be walking out of the room having learned. Um, and the first is to really learn to um, from and reflect on the experiences of Athena as someone who had an experience related to this topic within the child welfare system. Um, there's a lot for us all to learn from listening to those who have been a part of the system, and we'll spend some time to do that today, and then we'll move to think more about what's happening nationally with regards to um, the psychotropic medication use among children in foster care. And, and we'll see that her experiences, although certainly unique, are not infrequent among the, the child welfare system. Um, and, uh, and I'll take you through some data um, that is our best understanding of rates of, of mental and behavioral health need among children in foster care and then service utilization and specific psychotropic medication use. I've also incorporated some slides specific to Kentucky to help bring it back home for you. And then uh, uh, I'll also speak a bit about um, just what are the federal and, the, um, and state responses to psychotropic medication oversight. And then we're going to be highlighting a resource that recently was um, developed by the Children's Bureau and the Administration for Children and Families that, uh, a lot, that uh, provides a, a tool for youth themselves to be using who are in foster care around making decisions related to psychotropic medication use, as well as for their caregivers, many of you in the room I know, um, and, and as, a, as an, uh, a companion to that original um, uh, a guide. So uh, Cynthia will be speaking to that for us um, this afternoon. So without further ado, although not on our um, program, only due to the fact that there were timing issues, we didn't have Athena join our panel until recently, um, so she didn't make it onto the program as a speaker with Cynthia and myself, we, I really think you'll probably learn more from her than you do from either of us. Um, and so with um, no further ado, I'd, I'd love to have, some, uh, have Athena share her story with us. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, my name is Athena Madison, and I am here to speak a bit about my story as it pertains to the foster care system, to uh, experiencing uh, mental health uh, issues, and my experience with uh, psychotropic meds. 
um, not so long ago, and I really want to stress the importance of addressing um, mental health for foster youth. Um, not so long ago, me addressing those issues in myself was the fork in the road um, for whether I would succeed or become another statistic. And most foster youth, you know, there's so much stigma behind it that never gets addressed. Um, when I was uh, seven years old, my mom passed away. That was probably one of the biggest traumas uh, in my childhood. Um, but that wasn't the only one. There's so many back-to-back -back traumas that happened. Um, and because she passed away, everything kind of spiraled out of control. Um, when I turned eight years old, I was in the system for the first time, and I had no idea what that meant. And I had to, um, it was kind of like being displaced constantly. Um, and we had, you know, there's so much chaos going on, I can't really say it all. Um, but it was very unsettling. It was very disruptive. Um, so we were on and off, and I got to a point uh, in my life where I realized I was about 10, 12, and I realized I was going to end up dead or prostituted, and there was just no life there for me. And I really had dreams, and I wanted to be somebody, and I was the eldest of three, so I, I had my brother and my sister depending on me. And I decided to seek out the foster care system because I remember I'd been in it when I was eight years old. And um, between the ages of seven and 14, there's so much trauma that um, I, I developed something called hypervigilance where uh, you kind of, I personally kind of shut off most of my emotions and only carried around fear and anger so that I could deal with my everyday life. Um, and I didn't know this of me. Um, is just kind of my nature to survive um, and at the same time developing a lot of PTSD. And so when I finally found an entrance into the system at 14 and found a different version of permanency, um, that in itself um, was very traumatizing. It was like opening up a can of worms because for the first time I didn't have to be in this survival state anymore. And so everything came flooding out. The six, seven years that I had been suppressing just kind of blew up in my face. And I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know why. And my foster parents didn't know what was going on with me. They kind of just, you know, foster kids come that way. You know, it's just kind of shoved off into that um, category. And I was too ashamed to speak up because I thought, you know, what is wrong with me? I can't stop crying. And I don't know what I'm... And the hypervigilance, it's, it's kind of... It's when your survival skills just don't turn off um, because your mind is so used to being in a survival situation that it doesn't know that you're no longer in danger. And so I, I was trying to get out of this mode and I didn't know how. And when I entered the system, I have so many foster parents that just didn't understand what was going on. And I was so paranoid and hearing like the jingle of keys, I thought my dad was coming and I jumped right back into that mindset and um, being pulled apart from my siblings, that was traumatizing. And so it was just this constant re-triggering. Um, and I kind of had no help. I was kind of inside myself. And, you know, foster parents are really conditioned to kind of put you in school and you do this and you do that. And they're trying to, they're trying to regulate some kind of normalcy, but they kind of bypass the, how are you? <laughs> are you okay? Um, and so when I found some kind of stability, I realized I wasn't stable at all. Um, it was more just me kind of regressing to shutting off a lot of the emotions because I just couldn't deal with them. Um, and so when I graduated high school, I finally had time to kind of be me a little bit. And I realized I really need um, to, to, to heal, to like move on because I just can't. And, um, and I noticed it was creating this huge block inside me um, to move forward. And so I reached out to a therapist. I figured, you know, like, I have no answers. And I was getting to a point where I was going to do some very desperate things for kind of quick relief. And I kept kind of, uh, I, you know, I felt ashamed for myself, kind of pitied myself for even thinking that way. And um, my therapist, um, she was very open-minded, and I told her everything. Um, she made me do something called uh, trauma cognitive behavioral therapy, um, where she made me replay and retell my traumas over and over again until I was desensitized to them, till I no longer they no longer had that effect on me. And um, 
that was very, I, I can't explain it. It was amazing because it was so helpful, but it was some of the worst years ever. Um, just kind of constantly having to replay it. And I do therapy about three to four times a week for about three hours at a session, which um, normally it's more like once a week for one hour. <laughs> and even though um, I was doing three, four times a week for about three hours, it still wasn't enough. And I'd come home to kind of decompress of decompressing. And um, it was never kind of, I could never turn it off. Um, and my PTSD came back and it kind of just got worse. Um, and I, my therapist wanted me to find some kind of coping mechanisms um, to kind of deal with everything that was happening to me. And she suggested things like meditating and silent camps where you just kind of go for a week and don't talk. Um, and just different things, just any kind of uh, healthy outlet. And I found um, a lot of peace in painting. And so I'll show you some pictures later um, about some of the stuff that I did while I was um, going through that therapy. And painting was such a big, um, it was, there's, there's such a big result from that. It was just such a big deal to me because I could just turn my mind off and kind of just paint whatever came to my brain. I wouldn't even plan it. And then the painting turned out to always kind of have some kind of effect or tie to what I was doing in real life. And I just thought it was really kind of scary how even when I didn't want to think about it, I was kind of forced to. Um, when I, I, and so throughout this time, I've, I, to this day, I'm 21. I still am doing therapy, not as often. So my, my therapist tells me, she's really proud of me. She says, you know, we went from three to four times a week to one, one time a week every month. And it's just such a big leap. Um, but yeah. And so, um, if we could go to the next slide. Um, well, so some of these, um, paintings that are here are, um, from my time in care when I, I just couldn't deal the first painting up there. Um, yeah, the skeleton, it was, uh, my way of kind of interpreting. I felt like my heart was being torn out of me and I just didn't know like where it would land. Um, the elephant next to it, it was kind of like hoping, um, kind of some kind of release, but like a happy release. And the elephant is all dark and black and white, but everything that comes out is all color. Um, I paint the anatomy a lot. I associate a lot of hurt with the human body. So down there, um, I, there's a part of me that it's like, I'm just running. It's like this really deep need. And I remember just feeling like, I just want to run away. And I, I just wanted to envision just really tall grass and like a meadow and just running freely, which is something that I think a lot of foster youth don't feel like they can do. They feel kind of trapped in their heads and in their situation. And even years after foster care, they're still kind of trapped because they never got to heal. Um, the, the, sh the woman down there that's kind of shouldering away, um, that's just kind of a very literal response to like, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to deal with this. I just want to not be here right now. Um, up there, the heart, um, it's bleeding gold. Um, and it's kind of just, uh, I, I think it's a way of me, uh, kind of, giving myself more credit for everything I've been through um, and kind of just uh, finding some self-confidence in me. Um, and then I love trees. I think they represent life. So I'm painting some trees. <laughs> um, down there, uh, there's four paintings. There's one down here in the bottom corner um, and it's just a couple kissing. And I think um, it was when I was about 16 and um, I couldn't associate myself to anybody in, in school. I was too traumatized, um, always being triggered by anything, by something somebody would say or where I would go. Um, my, my campus was a very open campus. There's no, it's not gated when I went to high school. And so I felt like, oh my God, my dad could just walk in here at any moment. Um, and so it was kind of this longing for, for normal. And I could see all the kids around me just dating and going through like that phase, you know, that you do when you're growing up. And I just never had that. Um, the girl um, right next to her, uh, right there, yes, that one, it's a very interesting painting. Um, it's a combination of interpreting both the emotional and mental and physical responses of feeling um, constantly re-traumatized. And I know you can't see so much detail because it's just so small in the picture, but her mouth is gagged. 
Um, her lungs are black. They're dark. There's a grenade in her stomach. So it's kind of just like the constant anxiety and always feeling like you're going to throw up. Um, her limbs are broken. You know, she can't help herself even if she wanted to. Um, and there's a broken bulb in her brain um, that kind of just represents your mind shutting off. And, and always, you know, you always want to kind of help yourself, but you can't, and you don't know how, and it's kind of like life is winning. Um, the painting next to it, um, that kind of looks like Day of the Dead inspired, um, was a time when I was really sad thinking about my mom, and she would paint a lot of Day of the Dead stuff, and so I thought, oh, I should, you know, I, I probably got painting from her anyway, um, so I thought I should paint something like that in her memory. Um, and then there's a smaller kind of body um, painting down there, and you can't see the detail in this photograph, but her entire body is a tornado, um, and it's just kind of whirling, and the only thing you can see is, the, like, her beating heart, um, and I think it's just also just representing the chaos of it all. Um, my, my experience with mental health, it wasn't, like, I wasn't, I was very unstable, but I wasn't, um, it didn't show on the outside. I wasn't like violently acting and yelling at people. I kind of just break down and cry everywhere I went. Um, when I was my when I was in therapy, my therapist suggested psych meds, and she suggested antidepressants and um, uh, anxiety medication, and that was a horrible experience. I um, I think she, she's really well meaning, but um, I had every side effect you could possibly think of. I would sleep sixteen hour days and. I fell asleep through all my freshman year in college, and um, I'd wake up in places I don't remember being in, um, and I, I feel like I lost gaps of time. Um, I used to teach uh, the independent living program classes to the Vashi locally, and I'd see how their staff members would come in and give them their daily dose of anti or you know psych meds, and they would go from happy, bubbly, interactive students to zombies, and they just zone out and I just thought this is this is ridiculous like it's like you're taking this person's youth away you're not even letting them be a person um and so I was completely anti-psych meds and when my therapist adjusted I was like what are you kidding me like no um but she you know I was getting to a point where I couldn't keep swimming on my own the therapy was way too much but I kept going because I know I needed it and I really wanted to just be normal or find some healing. Um, so I did it and, um, I'm never doing that again, but, um, I, it was horrible. I just blacking out and not knowing where you wake up and, or why you're losing so much weight. It made me more depressed. Um, I kind of felt more unguided, if that makes sense, or lost because my therapist was trying to guide that situation and trying to help me through it with a the therapy, but I felt more lost because I was I had so many spots out of my day missing, and I just remember just showing up to therapy almost every day of the week, coming home crying, trying to explain it to my foster parents, who nobody understood. Um, they just kind of knew things were really bad, but that was it. Um, and then, yeah, it was just a very lonely experience, and the psych meds were just not the, the way to go. Um, for me, it was definitely painting. Um, but... There's kind of a happy end to my story. <laughs> I got adopted when I was 20 years old. I was the second case in California to get adopted under the new Assembly Bill 12 um, as a non-minor dependent. And, um, you know, I have a lot of goals in my life. So I definitely don't want foster care to be a kind of identity that stops me from growing or becoming anybody in the future. I want to open a nonprofit that... Um, kind of caters to young artists, especially in foster care, um, where it's kind of like a museum of little art studios. I know that sounds weird, but I think it would be amazing to just walk through that and see kind of everybody's process. Um, I want to write a few books. Um, I'd like to write an anthology about foster care success stories and failures because the failures, um, you know, me being here today, um, I am considered a success story. So you hear all of my trauma and all the bad, but I am still here and I have succeeded. You don't hear about the kids that didn't because they're not here, because they're homeless. And so I think that's very important and it's not spoken about. And so I want to make an anthology about that. Um, and then I am a political science and English major. Um, and I love 
child welfare. I love advocating, and so policy is just definitely my heart. So, thank you. Athena, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Can you all hear me in the back? Okay, great. Thank you so much for sharing your story. So um, what we wanted to do was take an opportunity to see if you all had um, one or two questions of Athena. Um, we just really want to try to take this time to um, answer any questions that you might have for her. So we want to open up the floor for that. Okay. I just want to congratulate her. Oh, we're gonna get, we're gonna get the mic. So whenever you ask your um, question, if you can also just give us your name and um, where you're from, that would be great. Thank you. My name is Brent Cottle, yeah. and I just want to say thank you for sharing what you shared, and uh, congratulations. Uh, it's awesome to see that you found a niche in art because I'm an artist as well, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and uh, I've expressed myself through art a lot through my life as well. So I don't know. I just kind of connected with you there. Mm -hmm. And I think it's awesome. I just want to let you know that. Thank you. Any other questions for Athena? No. While you all are kind of thinking about it, I actually have a, um, a question for you, Athena. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of your experience um, with psychotropic medication and with the child welfare system, um, kind of thinking about support services, um, and maybe something that might have been helpful on a systems level. Have you kind of given any thought to what might have been helpful for you? Mm, there's, I think there's a lot of things that would have been helpful. Um, if my foster parents were more aware and they knew what I was going through, I, I wouldn't have felt so alone. Um, if I had been given an option, if I, my psychiatrist had actually gotten to know me, because he saw me once and he just kind of took my therapist report and said, okay, I think we're going to give you this, this, this. And it was just kind of a blind decision. And he was impacting my life in such a big way that I wouldn't even know how big. Um, so I think that it was just kind of intrusive and disrespectful. Um, and I, I know foster youth are rarely given a choice because people chop them down as, you know, you're damaged and you're young, so we know better. Um, and I think I, w I would have appreciated having a choice, having an opinion even, um, being considered, um, and then being able to say no if I didn't want to, if it got too bad, um, because I, I had to take them for a minimum of six months for it to have any effect on me. But the effects started like within the first month. And I was like, are you kidding me? I have to do this for five more months? This is ridiculous. After a while, I started um, flushing the t pills down the toilet because I just couldn't take it anymore. Um, so yeah, having a choice, um, having a more in-depth conversation about what I would be experiencing, what that would look like in conjunction with therapy, um, and having more support, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Athena. Is it, okay, that is awesome. Hi, I'm Kim. Congratulations, Hi. too. I, that's, I'm very proud of you. That is Thank awesome. You. Thank um, you. We are foster parents as well. Mm -hmm. And did you seek out any help once you realized you didn't want to be on those medications? How did you finally get somebody to listen to you to get off of them? Um, it's funny. as My therapist and I are really close. And so even though she was really close to me and she would have been the person I would tell um, that I wanted to stop, I was so afraid to tell her that because she, she just was – she kept – thinking, you know, you're doing so well and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I really don't want to disappoint you, but I'm like crumbling inside. Um, so I just stopped taking the medication and didn't tell her. And my foster parents were not invested. Um, they just, they, they, I was always a very independent kid. Um, you know, I, I was like 15, but I had my microwave, my fridge and my own laptop in my bedroom that I had to pay for myself. And they just kind of knew I was handling my business. So they were never involved in my life. And that also included therapy. Um, so at the end of the day, I just say, oh, hey, hi, I'm good. Good. Okay, great. And that was, that was our relationship. Um, so I stopped taking the medication and then my therapist, she said, you're doing really good with the medicine, right? And I was like, actually, I stopped taking it a while ago. <laughs> and um, so that, that was, yeah, that was really what happened. Mm -hmm. My name is Mandy Roberts. I work um, with foster parents. I do training. And I'm just curious, um, is there something that foster parent could have done 
that would have helped you connect with them to feel comfortable enough. Um, you know, that's my foster parents struggle sometimes. What can I do? They want to do something, but they're not therapists. They're not doctors. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's hard, you know, they want to know what can we do? Um, and I would like to be able to take at least part of your story back and Mm -hmm. talk to my foster parents to let them know there is something they can do. Yeah. Um, for me, and I know for most foster kids, you know, like a lot of foster kids are really conditioned and they condition themselves to not talk about their emotions because you're already stigmatized as broken and damaged. Um, and so f- at the end of the day, most foster kids just want to connect. Um, you know, they want love in their lives. I think that's basically what it comes down to. And in when I was first going through that therapy, my foster mom, the first thing I told her was uh, when I met her was, I don't love people. Don't expect me to love you. I, I won't say it. And that's it. And she was like, whoa. <laughs> Okay. (laughs) And I think from that day, she made it her mission to change my ideas on that. And she was the first person I said, I love you too. And so it was a a really heavy relationship to be going through and experiencing for the first time what a mother's love feels like and doing PTSD therapy. (laughs) Um, It was really heavy. Um, And I think maintaining that connection, because even though she had no idea what was going on in my therapy, um, she made it a point to say, I love you every day, to hug me, even though I did not want to. I was so desensitized to touch, to human touch. You know, I I, I mentioned how I had to shut my emotions off for a long time. That included physical touch, any kind of love, um, anything. And um, she kind of forced me to get back into that. (laughs) And she just hugged me, and I, I just freeze there like what are you doing to me right now um and it was so uncomfortable it was so foreign and um I think you know I'm not the only case that is like that um there's a lot of foster youth that are like that and it freaks them out and you know they'll just push you away they'll find ways they'll make themselves uh unattractive to you you know they'll to so that you don't want them um people do that all the time I do that all the time you know Thank you. And so, um, Athena, in terms of your um, foster care placements, you you had a total of 13 placements. Yeah. So that in Mm -hmm. itself, as we know, as, you know, supportive adults and and, um, service um, caseworkers, that a lot of times that does affect um, our young people's ability to really connect on that Mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. And really for foster parents, um, you know, part of the workshop that you all are sitting in, in into today is going to give you some resources as caregivers and supportive adults that can really kind of help walk through some of those questions and um, walk through some tips and strategies for having those conversations and better connecting um, with young people in terms of their um, mental health and um, psychotropic medication use. Yes, uh, my name is David. And again, I want to thank you as well for telling your story. Thank you. I'm just curious as since... I don't know how long you've been telling your story for, but since you've came out with a story about the psychotropic medications and things, how have, what's the response been like from the mental health field or other people you've engaged with? Because it seems to be as social workers and false parents don't want kids to, to be on some of these medications, we get kind of shut down at times. So there's no, that, that doctor he was speaking of who, mm-hmm. who, sees this kid once every three months for medication management, mm-hmm. overrides everybody else. Mm-hmm. I have a problem with that. What, what kind of response have you got since you've told your story about not wanting these meds because of how it made you feel? Um, I have come into contact with a lot of foster parents and uh, caregivers and social workers who feel the same way, you know, who want to speak up for the youth and feel like they can't. And um, I remember when I was teaching the ILP classes, there was a few youth that had similar problems that they felt they themselves didn't have a voice. And, um, but when they started kind of, this is going to sound so terrible, but, um, what I did, for example, and they started doing the same was, um, you know what, I'm going to talk to your boss. I really don't want this. And you, you're treating my life like it's chess. Like, I'm going to tell me what your boss's name is. And there's this kind of fear. And um, it's funny because it's their life you're interrupting, not your own. Um, and so I don't, I don't understand what the kind of pushback is. Um, but I know that in the situations that I've seen with the youth I've worked with, um, it was always successful when they themselves kind of stood up for themselves and really just kind of found their voice and were like, no, I don't want this. I don't need it. I will take other 
um, modes uh, to heal and cope if you will let me and guide me through that and by all means, you know, and people have done that and it does work. Um, I think because it's uh, uncomfortable and it's different and, you know, the doctors uh, don't expect that. <laughs> so it's very like, okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, and we're going to go ahead and take um, one more question. And just so that you all know, if you don't have an opportunity to ask your question now, we're going to go ahead and move through the rest of the workshop, and then we'll have another Q&A se section at the end. So if you can jot down your question, if you didn't get yeah. to it, um, please know that you'll have an opportunity to, um, to do that towards the end of the session. Uh, I don't really have a question. Uh, I just want to uh, give encouragement. My name is Ian. Um, I spent 13 years in the foster care system as well. Okay. Um, and so I just want to um, appreciate you sharing your story and um, you doing the advocacy you're doing and the political major, you said, and all that stuff. And yeah. I appreciate you, you connecting with the, the people you connected with and, and keep doing this work. And I'm doing the same work. And so just know you're not alone out there, which you seem like you already know that. But <laughs> Thank just you. encouraging you even more that – you know, there's other people that are fighting with you and, you know, the fighting the good fight and just in terms of just knowing that we exist and, you know, we're, we're trying to, you know, get better and, and be success stories instead of statistics. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and um, turn things back over to Dr. Tom Mackey, who's going to go through objectives two and objectives three with us. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, um, Get him mic'd up so that he can, um, so you all can hear him when he speaks. 